Hello everyone. I hope you can see and hear me. Sorry, I always come on gradually like that. It probably seems kind of creepy. I don't mean it to be. I just, I'm, I, I'm like checking to see if I'm doing things right. So good afternoon, if you're watching. Hello. Um, make sure my mic's out in the right place. Hopefully, that's like, hang on. Let me try this. How's that? <laughs> I don't know. Um, I can't tell if that sounds better or worse, but hopefully better. Uh, good afternoon. Good to see you all, or see many of you are online, so that's great. So hello, thanks for saying hi, Alex and Sally. Um, today, let me see, actually I need to turn off some of my music. Hello. I always like seeing y'all say hello. Uh, so, I'm, it is hard to find the right window to click on on this computer sometimes, so I'm trying to find my window that has the music in it. Um, that music I was playing, by the way, that's kind of random. I just uh, was looking for copyright-free um, vaporwave music, and I found this artist who goes by a name that is um, HTML, so it's the closing body tag, uh, which we will see later in this episode of DDSD 395 Applied Digital Studies. And the name of that piece right there that was just playing is um, dot delay parentheses, so that's like a, like a JavaScript uh, function probably, so I don't know. I don't know anything about the artist. It just happened to come up kind of randomly and uh, seemed kind of appropriate. So I am coming to you from a new setup. You can't see it, but uh, it's new to me. At least I, I, this is my first day with it, and you can see I'm kind of bouncing around because I've got a standing desk set up now, so I'm actually addressing you standing up, uh, which is kind of how I'm used to teaching, right? So this is sort of something that I wanted to try uh, at home, but I had to build it. Uh, so this is a project over the past couple of weeks, uh, past couple of weekends. Hey, Rachel. Hey, Olivia. Uh, I built the um, uh, it's a standing desk that can convert. It's not motorized or anything fancy like that. I mean, I saw plans for that too. Um, hi, Crystal. Uh, but I didn't uh, feel like doing the motorized thing, so I just, because I figured that would take more time. So I went with just the re regular wood. It's mostly pine. Uh, but it's pretty nice. Um, I got a few little things to add to it still, but very happy with how it turned out. I'll give you all a tour at some point, I guess. Uh, I know you probably don't care, but I'm very proud of, I'm proud of my you know, limited woodworking skills, and it's fun to have a project. Uh, so I, let's see, today the agenda is, um, well, as follows. So I'd like to talk about this short story, There Will Come Soft Rains by Ray Bradbury. And in the notes for today, what I did is I, I just posed some questions, the kind of things that would be a, a discussion question if we were together having a discussion about it. So feel free to, let me jump into it, here it is. Um, as we are, uh, as I'm talking about things, so take a look here. These are the questions um, that I kind of want to get to in discussion. So if you seeing these any seeing these questions have any thoughts or, or just want to respond to these, go ahead and do that. Uh, feel free to go ahead and do that in the live stream chat channel. And I think I saw Matt say hi. So hi Matt. I'm trying to give everyone a shout out whenever you <laughs> whenever you drop in. Uh, so um, yeah, I mean the, the the idea of connectedness here. I'm 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 really playing with this idea of connectedness to extend it further. We started looking at the internet and how it's connected, how the web connects people via the internet. Um, we talked about other kinds of connections in the history of hypertext, uh, other kinds of hypertextual connections between documents. Um, but I think there's also this related idea that is becoming increasingly common where the internet is not just for people to send each other things or connect to each other over different platforms, but it is also this thing that connects all kinds of things together. And the classic example I have is in my own life, my own experience, was that I bought a dishwasher a few years ago and I um, was surprised to find that it had an ethernet port in it and it came with a one foot ethernet cable and I was like, what is this? And I looked it up and there's, a, there's an extra thing you can buy to uh, make it a smart dishwasher. And I guess what makes it smart is that it can connect to your Wi-Fi in the home and I suppose tell you when it's done. Um, I don't know. I, I don't know if you could start it remotely, but that seems kind of risky um, if it has that capability, but uh, it just occurred to me as something that I had never occurred to me. Like it was not something that I needed. It was not something that I had ever thought, gee, it would be nice if I could get an email when my dishwasher's done, but uh, that exists now, I guess. So uh, I just posed a few questions here about this general phenomenon of things being smart. And I, I know of several examples and I'm kind of curious what you think of when we talk, when I raised that question of uh, smart devices in your homes. Like, what are some things that you uh, can think of that 
are smart devices, um, maybe some that are solving a, a genuine problem and are helpful, and maybe some things that are, are not, uh, things that probably should not be smart. So um, yeah, I mean, what do you think? Do you have any of these devices in your home? Uh, do they work? Is it, is, it, is it really changing your life because you have a smart toaster? Um, that's kind of the classic thing people come up with to make fun of this thing, um, the smart toaster. So do you have a smart toaster? Does it, um, does it solve problems <laughs> for you? Uh, I guess that's always the question with new technology. It's like, what problem is this solving? Um, and if it's not solving a problem, then why does it exist? Um, yeah, the uh, oh, iTunes. Uh, that's a humorous gif. Um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, the the washer dryer machine. That's that's a increasingly standard, Becca. Like, uh, I assume again that it tells you when it's done. Um, but you usually have to hook it up. Like you have to buy the dongle thing, and uh, then that's how it gets on your Wi-Fi. And then I'm, I assume there's an app, and then the app you know lets you do different things with it. <laughs> I also understand that some of the residence halls at UMW have smart, um, or like like the washer dryer stuff there is connected to an app, so it texts or it sends you a push notification, I guess, when your clothes are done. And I think you pay for it through that too. Yeah. They were, you say they were smart, or like, you, Becca says, yeah, the washer and dryers were smart, but maybe, are they not smart anymore? I remember, um, yeah, that was, that was, a new thing a couple years ago. <laughs> that's all right, Siobhan. And well, that's, the, you know, the, the washing machine dryer, these are tried and true technologies. And, you know, when it comes down to it, the mechanics, the plumbing, very simple device. And so really, uh, I mean, in my experience, there's not a lot of difference between a really high-end washer and like an okay one. And so getting an okay one is usually fine. Um, but uh, yeah, well, I'm glad to hear that's working, Sally. Like I, I am, you know, I, I had heard otherwise, like I had heard uh, that it was kind of tricky um, to work with or like it was slow or there were different issues with it. Um, but I think that, it, especially if you can pay for it, like I remember, you know, when I went to college, we just had to pay, it was just a quarter machine and like you literally just had to put quarters in it. And, um, but it was like $2 for a load, but it only take quarters. So you'd have to, everyone had these big like jars of quarters uh, to pay for it. And of course you'd forget, right? You'd let your clothes sit in there in the washer for too long and then they'd smell after a while. Um, and then, you know, or you'd you know, get down there, someone else's clothes would be in the way, you dump it on the floor, right? I mean, you get all these different things around it. Um, yeah, so that's a good point, Maggie. You have to have Wi-Fi in order for things to be, for smart things to do their smart thing, <laughs> right? Um, yeah, the Google speaker, right? So the Google speaker, I do have the, I mean, I broke down, but I got the, I have, we have Alexis, we have several in our house and the kids have their own and they, you know, there are certainly advantages to them, uh, how to access an inter-house intercom, uh, intra-house intercom. Yeah. And uh, that's pretty convenient. It plays music. I mean, that's pretty much all, all we do with it, but you can connect them to other things and let Alexa control your thermostat, for example. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, TV and entertainment, that seems like a pretty obvious place for technology, right? Like, that seems like a reasonable place to do things. And it definitely, like, I, we have the Amazon thing where you can speak to it when you, instead of typing. Like, if, you're, if there's something you're trying to search for on Netflix, you, it's very convenient to be able to just talk to it and uh, say what you want. And it usually works okay. Yeah. Um, but I think you're seeing, like, as like Maggie and Caroline are talking about a little bit there, the idea that... Um, like that it just works isn't always true. Like it, it may work for some people, it may work not for other people. And those differences have to do with like your, you know, the current phone. Like what if it came out and you had to have an iPhone? Like what if the university said, here's this new thing everyone has to use to access their laundry, uh, but it only works for the iPhone. So that would exclude a huge chunk of users like me who have uh, Android devices. Um, or what if they required you to have a Windows phone? <laughs> yeah, so you can see any time that you create any sort of system of uh, of convenience that becomes this uh, other thing too, right? Yeah, yeah, Siri, right, Siri. We talked a bit about the, the Siri Alexa kind of stuff with uh, artificial intelligence a couple weeks ago. Uh, does anyone have a smart um, doorbell, like the Ring doorbell? Um, I'll type that in here. Have a smart doorbell with a camera or a thermostat. 
Uh, the thermostat's the other thing that a lot of people are starting to get now. Like the ther the, the idea of the smart thermostat is, um, uh, yeah, the ring doorbell. So uh, I think the, the ring doorbell does seem like it could be pretty convenient in some ways to have um, video so people could you could I guess with some of them you can talk back and forth like so if somebody shows up to your front door and you're not home you could answer the door sort of and say hey I, I'm not home or you know yell at them to stop stealing your packages or whatever <laughs> I've seen stuff like that those different videos um, I don't know yeah my parents got something like that it's not a ring it's something else but it's it is kind of useful sometimes to check up and I have access to it too so I can actually check on their house if they're not if they're if they are home I can actually turn on the cameras in their house um, they have a, in their a camera in their living room so sometimes like if I want to see if they're home I can just turn on their their living room camera to see if they're home <laughs> and then I, then I call them um, yeah so the outside lights timer so Carolyn that's an interesting kind of low tech sort of thing because that's something that mimics the presence or replaces the, the action that you would otherwise have had to do. Like, I don't have that. So when I want to turn on my lights at night, I go, I have to go turn it on. Wait, or do I have, I might have an automatic something. I don't remember. I have a motion activated light. Um, but that's, you know, that's the kind of thing where, it's, you know, a technological thing being a little bit smart, like knowing, hey, it's nighttime or it's seven o'clock or whatever you set it to, uh, that does help. Um, you know, I have that for Christmas lights, which I should probably, Start thinking about everybody in my neighborhood is getting into Halloween lights. I don't know if that's a thing everywhere or or not, but next door is they're pretty elaborate. And then down the street, you know, like they do like the sort of fake caution tape everywhere and like spider webby things, and then like lights, like tons and tons of Halloween lights. Like um, it looks cool, I guess, but I don't know. It just seems like a new thing to have to do, and I don't really want to do it. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, oh, this, this is a good idea. The birdhouse. Um, I think uh, I, I sh I've been thinking about getting that too. We've had several like nests, birds' nests we've kept an eye on, but they end up so far like something always happens to them, like the birds disappear one day, like the babies do or the eggs do. So I think there's several different uh, predators possibly in our yard. So it might be interesting to catch that um, on camera. Uh, let's see what's out there. Um, okay, so uh, can you think of anything, um, let's see, these are all, we've all talked about things that we kind of have already. Can anyone think of smart things that really shouldn't be and maybe have gone wrong? <laughs> uh, like, um, I, I'm, there are different examples. I, like, uh, I, I mentioned the smart toaster and that's something that I think really exists. Uh, let's see. Uh, IOT, like internet, that's the uh, abbreviation for Internet of Things. IOT toaster. <laughs> Let's see. Pretty sure this exists. Oh, cool. So here's an instructable for making your own. Neat. Now, this sounds like fun. Now, this. <laughs> okay. Yeah. This looks delightfully complicated. I love it. Um, <laughs> Okay, what in the world? This is great. PubNub? So then, yeah, so you have to program it, it looks like. Wow, this is this looks cool, I like this. But uh, this is obviously kind of a joke product. Uh, I wonder if, if it actually exists. Um, there is a Twitter account I follow, and this is their name, the name of this account is a little bit appropriate, inappropriate. Um, so if IOT is Internet of Things, there is a Twitter account that is the Internet of Shit, <laughs> and it has uh, good, uh, like it covers this kind of stuff and makes fun of this kind of stuff. Um, it's uh, widely uh, followed. It's quite funny, but it also, it points out real issues, like the, the idea that Keurig is selling a machine that has DRM, so digital rights management, uh, which means that you can only use Keurig pods with it, so there's some kind of programming in it, there's probably some kind of QR codes on the pods that authenticate them as as true Keurig pods, and then that's, those are the only pods that that coffee maker will make. Um, a smart salt shaker? How does that work? <laughs> uh, that's good. That sounds great. Um, that's one, but the, uh, the other one they've been talking about a little bit, I guess you can get um, drones, or I guess Amazon, and you know, Amazon owns Ring, uh, looks like they are making little in-house drones now, which um, uh, sounds 
kind of okay. I don't know. I'm not really sure. Like most of these things, I'm not sure what problems it solves. It might be neat to have a camera sometimes, but I mean, I already have cameras everywhere, so I feel like, why do you need that? Um, so anyway, um, that's uh, this is a good account to follow if you're interested in um, kind of keeping an eye on these things. But um, I don't know. So I'm really interested, uh, Emily, if you, E. Martin too, if you can, oh yeah, the juice arrow. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. Um, smart fork. Wow, these are great. Smart windshield wipers. Huh. So this is the smart, is the smartness in your car or in the windshield wiper, <laughs> Sally? <laughs> um, that sounds interesting. Because like obviously it's pretty easy to tell if it's raining when you're driving. So like just flip it, right? I mean, that seems easy. Um, it connects to the internet and Alexa and you can ask for a pinch of salt or something else like more like, like maybe volume. Like you could say, I want, maybe if you, I mean, if you're really monitoring your sodium intake, that might be useful. Like if you do to really precisely and quickly portion, um, Salt, I guess that, that could make sense. But it's not gonna put it on your food, I guess, unless it's sort of a catapult system. Like that would be <laughs> cool. So you could be like sitting at the dinner table and be like, doop, 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 one salt, please. And then it just flings salt on your, on your plate. That would be, you know, have it, sent, have it in the middle of the table, right? And then everybody has their app with it and then they say how much salt they want and then it just like rotates and catapults salt at them. Makes sense to me. <laughs> Yeah, I think that they, a lot of these are, they do sound kind of useless, right? Oh, and there it is. It does, I mean, that looks like it's ready to fling salt. <laughs> I, I doubt that's what it really does. Um, but that would be great if it did. Yeah, so I think this article that um, Samantha's linked to is the Juicero, and I think that was, yeah, Juicero, that was one that was also widely mocked for um, kind of, for being expensive and pointless. And I think it was also a Kickstarter originally. And then there was this whole sort of discussion about, is it actually like, what the heck is the point of it? Because they sell you kind of pre chopped up like packets of uh, fruit goo and then you, or fruit, and then you squeeze it to juice it. Uh, or it, it does, it's basically just a, you know, um, but yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what the point is. Uh, I guess, I mean, I guess the idea of compressing instead of shredding might be, there might be some arguments for that being a different quality of juice product. Um, but I mean, I can tell you it's pretty easy to squeeze stuff like, or, or, you know, or just to get a mechanical press of some sort, like a panini press, right? I mean, as long as it has a hinge and uh, two flat sides and a hinge, you could, you know, crank it down probably most people could. And then, you know, you'd have juice. Like I could see for someone who didn't, you know, but like you have to pre-chop it, so I don't know. <laughs> there's different. Uh, I could maybe see a pro and a con there, but anyway, there's um, there's a lot of things that are out there that are smart that maybe shouldn't be. Uh, I guess that's the point. So I was interested in this. These two stories, um, "There Will Come Soft Rains" by Ray Bradbury and "Mother of Invention," uh, because they deal with smart things and putting smart things in the context of the home. And I think that's what's really interesting about these two stories that they both focus on the idea of a home what it means to be a home, and um, well, they, they don't necessarily focus on it, but they focus on the technology being part of that. And I thought we could take a look at these because they give us some interesting things to think about, uh, as that's the, you know always the case. That's always why I assign things when I do. Um, so looking first at There Will Come Soft Rains, um, it's very short, it's a single page. Uh, I just, I included the, two, the second page because this is the page that comes after it. And it's kind of hard to see this scan. I just found the scan on some website. Uh, but it has it has a whole issue of this magazine on this website. So I thought the page immediately after it was kind of interesting because it's it is a picture of domestic life and it looks it's kind of hard to tell, but it looks like maybe it's several different scenes together. But this looks like on the top right, like a mother, like a, or a wife walking in with a tray of beer, and then this guy looks like he's outside painting though i can't tell if that's a tree or like a wallpaper or something and then i don't know if these people here are in the room or like if this is the same guy in three different situations anyway the point is that um it has an idea it has some idea i think there of 
of home. Oh, okay, oh no, it has a title. So this is, it's Getting the Boat Ready by Douglas, I can't quite read that, Croc, Croc Evil, something? I'm gonna find this original painting or illustration, whatever it is, um, but we'll, hopefully you get the idea that there is some idea of home being created here because it's from this Home Life in America series. Let's see, let's get it out here. Getting the boat ready, home life in America. I'm just Googling, let's see. This is gonna give me totally random things. Yeah, I need to get the name of the artist, uh, Doug, Douglas Croc, Croc Daniel. <laughs> I cannot read that. Uh, let me see, how far can I zoom in? That's better. Crockwell. Croc Daniel. Um, ah, here we go. Nice. Here it is. Okay, so this is great. So this is the full color. So beer belongs, dot, 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 enjoy it. Uh, I guess two versions of this ad with the same um, people, perhaps, in different points in their life. But anyway, so this is a, an actual scene, it looks like, of people having fun and getting the boat ready and enjoying some beer. Or Well, this guy's the only one working, but everyone else is hanging out drinking beer. So, okay. <laughs> anyway, uh, kind, of a, kind of not related. Um, but you can see how the the whole idea that beer is part of the the dinner experience. That's what they're kind of arguing for there. So let's see. I saw a question come up. Okay. So uh, Ginger Snaps had a question, or uh, states are kind of confused by soft rain. So do you have any questions about it? That's always a good place to start with stories. Um, you may have questions too about uh, Mother of Invention. There's a couple of things there that are kind of between the lines. That you have to read between the lines a little bit on that especially the ending. So if you have questions about these things, go ahead and put them in the, in the chat and I'll try to uh, address them if I can. So um, uh, there will come soft rains by Ray Bradbury. Ray Bradbury, of course, is a great science fiction writer, um, very pro prolific in the 1950s, or, uh, especially uh, most of his well-known work was written then. Um, the, um, the, okay, Alex asks, I see that. I'll, I'll see if we can, or well, ask me, well, tell me what you think and then I'll see if that's, I can, if I can correct, if I can, um, modify it or if I need to modify it, you might be right. Um, but the, uh, so Ray Bradbury uh, writes, I think this actual short story has been, was adapted for either Twilight Zone or something similar, but um, it, it's a very striking image. Like it's a very, um, honestly, kind of a disturbing image of, uh, of a, a smart house, uh, a connected house, um, and yet there are no people. And so that's kind of, there's kind of a, a disturbing angle to this. Uh, similar to uh, the, uh, the Mother of Invention story, there's a pretty uh, dark side to it too, um, although much more in the open, I guess, uh, than is the case with Ray Bradbury's story. Uh, so, so Ginger Snaps, if you, if you have a question, you can pose it, or I just, I, I can say a couple of things to help you maybe think through it. Um, you know, this is a, uh, a story, it's, set, it's written in 1950, but set in 1985. And if you recall, one of the big things that people were concerned about in the 1950s about the future had to do with the threat of nuclear war. And so this is a Cold War kind of piece. It's expressing a kind of Cold War anxiety. And in that context, I think the poem here in the title is a big clue um, to help understand what Ray, Ray Bradbury wants us to think about this. Uh, so the, the house at one point um, decides to read a poem uh, it's, it thinks it's communicating with the homeowner and saying, um, you know, I, I, what poem would you like? And then uh, hearing no response, the house just decides to pick one at random. But the one it picks at random, of course, is not truly random. It's Ray Bradbury's choice what poem to put here. And this is a real poem by Sarah Teasdale. Uh, there will come soft rains in the smell of ground and swallows circ circling with their shimmering sound and frogs in the pools singing at night and wild plum trees and tremulous, tremulous white. Um, so thinking about this theme, uh, thinking about what's going on in the poem, um, maybe could help you understand or think about what's happening to the house and to the world around it and kind of what, uh, what the takeaway is, um, for Ray Bradbury. Let's see. Okay. So 
So, like the way I read the ending was that Veo's wife and her house knew that he was having an affair in the house, stood up sensing the OB3 leaving. I thought the OB. Um, yes, Alex, I think you are correct. <laughs> that is that is my understanding of the uh, the re ending as well. Um, let me type that. That is my understanding as well. Yeah, that's that's the idea being that the house that we've been hearing from OB3 has done all these things without checking with its owner, um, but has kind of patterned itself after the desires of its owner, um, means that, you know, in our case, it patterns itself after a desire for protection, uh, For I mean, not in, in the case of our narrator, um, but for the, um, for uh, the other house, uh, the desires and, and belief, and, and positions of the owner there are much more malicious. And so the house, takes on that maliciousness and it goes from there. So so I think the rats are, I think the rats are robots, like Roombas. I think that's the, I think that's the idea, that these are mechanical rats um, that are crawling, like coming out from the walls, sweeping things up, running back. Is that what was not clear or is that, um, or there's something else because I know it says here like uh, out of like on the first column sort of about two-thirds of the way down it says out of warrens in the wall tiny mechanical mice darted uh, the rooms were a crawl with the small cleaning animals I think is that the talk if that's the part you're talking about that's those are robot mice like Roombas I mean but not obviously like circular like Roombas but he's envisioning these future robots as um, you know mice like mouse like rat-like um, and it did refer to rats though earlier or, or later so I'm trying to see if there's another part you might be thinking about I don't know. Yeah, the mice come out when the dog dies too. Yeah, that part's. Ugh. Yeah, that's sad. <laughs> yeah, the rats didn't become intelligent. They were just they were robots. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, the the family dies. Um, right, and the dog uh, has survived somehow, but um, does not survive the story. Uh, so it's survived. There's been a nuclear blast. So I guess, to, so to me, I, I guess the big question, and this is more of the interpretive question about both of these, and, and the reason I, I put them together is they, they, they raise ideas about, they don't just sort of introduce the technology and say, wouldn't it be neat? Um, yeah, exactly, Samantha. That was a, I mean, that's a really disturbing image, but that's an image um, that's almost a hallmark image or a signature image of uh, nuclear anxiety and uh, lots of different texts uh, have versions of that. For example, in my graphic novel class, we're reading Watchmen, and there's that recurring image of uh, the shadow of a nuclear blast. Um, but the yeah, um, so there, there are a couple of things here. So both of these stories have something else going on besides just being like a cool house with neat technology in it. Um, both of these are set in an apocalypse um, or in a, in a, in a, in a um, you know, end of the world kind of dystopian scenario. The uh, question I have then is like, why is that? Like, why does this lead us to think about a, a future? Uh, I mean, why are these ideas connected? The idea of a smart house and a future without humanity, basically. Uh, I mean, it's not quite as pessimistic in, um, in Mother of Invention, but it is. If you notice, some, if you read between the lines a little bit, uh, it talks about a, an ecological disaster, a global ecological disaster, um, this place in Nigeria is one of the few places that seems to have uh, done well with a, a new, like a genetically modified plant. Um, but of course that had the, the genet genetically modified plant changed the world, changed their economy, uh, Nigeria's economy. But it um, has all these consequences as things and, and stories like this all, always do. Technology always has consequences. So I'm just kind of curious about the connection between a smart home and um, the end of the world <laughs> and, and why is that you know what is there a connection there and I raised that question without really any specific ideas in mind like I'm not sure why that that seems to be a theme in both of these works 
but I'm curious if you have any ideas. It looks like several of you are typing, so maybe you have ideas. I mean, I'm really interested to see what you think. I, I, I mean, the idea of the home and like the domestic life, I think there's some interesting language about what the, how, the home meant to the family that used to live there in, in, in soft rains. Um, like it was a good house and had been planned and built by the people who were to live in it in the year 1980. Uh, the house was like many other houses in that year, many another house in that year. It fed and slept and entertained its inhabitants and made a good life for them. Um, this idea of like the home being the place of goodness and being a good place. And it says here, uh, living there was a contentment, just like being content and being whole and being a family, right? That's an idea that has to sort of be constructed. Like that's, that's suburbia. You know, it's not something that's always existed. Uh, humans throughout history have lived, you know, more agrarian life or more urban life. And the idea of a suburban life is pretty much a 20th century uh, invention. And so uh, this seems to be an expression of that. And so I wonder if there's something along those lines that might be helpful. By the way, this whole idea of like smart homes, uh, the video I was playing in the in intro in the lobby there as the, the countdown was going is a film from, I wanna say where, no, not that one. I had it a second ago, but it was, it was from the 1950s, I think. Um, probably has the cover, probably has the year at the beginning. Excuse me, but this was a film basically an infomercial by Westinghouse uh, talking about the total electric home and how great it's going to be whenever we have all these new technologies in our house. And so it demonstrates several different technologies. Uh, there's a few of these that are really good. This one's the, I like this one a lot. Uh, a lot of technology is really goofy, but the, um, uh, or, but it seems plausible. And then the, uh, there's one called 1999 AD, which is um, a very like psychedelic and, and a lot of fun. So I will, uh, share those links later, but those are um, things that are, are ways people imagine the future through the home, and the, the home became a context for, I think, visualizing difference. Oh, good, we have some answers. Um, uh, yeah, so, yeah, Smith is the idea of technology outlasting us. If we continue to make AI more intelligent, technology, yeah. Uh, Crystal, that's, a, that's been a theme we've seen with AI stuff, so that's a good connection. Um, and maybe it becomes so smart it doesn't need us anymore. Um, yeah, so Emily's putting out maybe a good point that the, the consumption of resources necessary to make this stuff viable might be so intense that it would be, um, it would lead to some of these problems of scarcity and uh, climate change, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting, uh, good connection there, Katya, too, to, to uh, the Fogo tennis story. Um, the idea of external motivations or, you know, or even a computer having motivations or loyalties, like that's the issue. Like if they can be motivated independently of programming, then that motivation can come from wherever, I suppose. Um, but I think like a lot of stories, these are, they, they're set in the future, but they're really about the present and they're really about people. And so I think uh, there's, there's things we can look at too. Oh, that's, that's Brian. Yeah. Brian. Um, Yeah, yeah. The more we do, uh, and I think, uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, there's there's a lot of great points here. So <laughs> I'll let you all keep going. And this story was, by the way, published in the same series as uh, the Fogo tennis stories when we were patched. Um, there's a whole bunch of these. It's the Future Tense Fiction um, series on, on Slate, and for each of these, there's a story and then an essay. So like they they kind of go together. Um, yeah, it is interesting how OB3 becomes a partner uh, almost, or uh, a doula, I think. You know, that's another kind of, um, I don't know if you've been around childbirth, but like the doula is like there to, not quite what a midwife wind wife does, but there to kind of make sure everything goes smoothly. Um, basically, that's that's just, that's massively uh, massively simplifying what to do, but it's, uh, uh, the I think of the house as kind of a doula or um, or maybe a midwife, but like it's it becomes, it's there for her in a way that obviously her ex-fiance is not. <laughs> Uh, but it's there to do what she needs, and in that moment she needs just, I mean, she needs has physical safety needs, but she also needs, um, you know, somebody to listen to, uh, somebody, somebody to listen to her and talk to her, so she's lonely, right? Um, mm -hmm. 
Yeah, yeah. There's like a there's a hap- unhappiness in terms of how ugly people are, and and how that's even in this advanced future, um, that's still an issue, right? That people are still mean and ugly and and are uh, hurtful and betray her, like her parents, right? Um, but the fact that it's um, so far in the future that, the, but even though we have solved lots of problems, I guess by being able to have houses that smart, we still haven't pro- solved the problem of you know, being kind to each other, right? Yeah, yeah, I think so too, Kelly. Yes, yeah, so this is a good discussion. Um, yeah, Siobhan has a good question though. This, I was trying to transition too, so Siobhan has a good question that we should um, go into. Um, so f- feel free to keep going in the chat, but I'm going to try to. Um, talk about your exercise, your programming exercise for this week, because Siobhan has raised a good, a good point. That is the action, uh, the activity for this week. So I'm going to transition to that now, but if you'd like to keep talking about other things, of course, you're welcome to um, on the live stream chat or online only or wherever, whichever channels you feel like. So uh, with about 12 minutes, I'm not sure how much I can do, but I will do my best to say a few things about how to put things online. So your basic goal for this week is to create a retro homepage, and that's gonna be something like a GeoCities page, something that has um, you know whatever theme or content or ideas you want. And I, I'm leaving this wide open because and uh, it's not even a formal assignment, but it's a, uh, a thing to do this week. And it can be about anything. So think back to when I asked you to look at old homepages on uucities that oocities.org or you know the the Wayback Machine. Uh, what kinds of things did people decide to make a web page about? Um, that's the kind of thing you might want to make a web page about, um, but using your modern technology. Uh, I'm in, I would like for you to embrace a retro aesthetic and make it look like a GeoCities page, an old-fashioned web page. Um, but you know we'll we'll get to we'll get to that. But we'll do some content first uh, or or some structure. And I want to make sure you know how to do a few things with that. So let me see. I need I have another set up here that I can switch to if I can find it. Um, yeah, that should work. Okay, so this is, sorry, let me, I'm doing a little bit of switching around here. Yeah, this should work, okay. Um, there we go. Hello, here I am, I'm, I'm down here now. Uh, the, uh, what I wanna do is talk a little bit about how to create a web page. And I'm gonna go through this pretty quickly, but I don't think there's a whole lot to cover. And if you need it to be slower, you can watch the playback later. I might make a standalone video too. Um, but the, uh, what we need here in order to make a web page on your domain, you just need a couple of things. You need over here, uh, this is Sublime Text. It's a, a text editor that's meant for writing code and you'll see why that's important in a moment. And then you just need a web browser, uh, but I'm using the web browser here for, to do two different things. I'm gonna preview the web page that I create on, in this web browser, and then I'm going to use this web browser to um, upload it to my website. So to make a, a place, first to be able to make a place for it, uh, as I said in the notes for today, I want to show you how to make a subdomain if you don't already have one or if you don't already know how. So this is umw.domains, and um, there is a guide for how to do this on the umw domains homepage. So if you would like to do the, you know, do this on your own later, uh, that's what I would kind of point you to. You go to help guides and then it's in here. Um, yeah, so uh, creating subdomains and subdirectories. One of the things it talks about is the difference between a subdomain and a subdirectory. So make sure you're clear on that. And I do recommend a subdomain for this, um, but I'm gonna, I'll just do it here so you can see it. And then get into writing a bit of code. I know I'm, I need to wrap up at 2.30, so I'm keeping an eye on the clock here. Um, let me log into my cPanel. So this is my domain, and I believe all of you have domains. If you do not, then you should get one, and um, please talk to me about that first. Uh, or like, I like to, whenever students are signing up for domains, I like to give them some advice, so um, please reach out if that's the case for you, that you if, if you need that, um, and I will give you some advice. <laughs> Otherwise, you can also set up an appointment with the DKC, and they can walk you through the whole process. So I have several domains here, and so I'm, Things look a little bit more complicated for me, but um, you're looking for this thing here, this little link that says subdomains under domains. And when you click on it, it takes you to the domain creator. And I will just put this one on djst101.net, but you probably just have the one thing to choose from here, uh, which is your actual domain. So this is a demo subdomain that I am creating to delete later. So let me show you that I saw a question. Um, you can't see what I'm doing. Oh, why? Oh, darn it. 
it's just it uh there we go so the um yeah obs doesn't like when i tell it to grab the right firefox i mean to grab the firefox window it it just sort of picks whichever one it feels like it doesn't uh remember which one i set this up to be with i should i should maybe switch to different um <laughs> i see you all talking to me now but i'm i'm good i know it's a little bit delayed but i'm seeing i you should be able to see it now and i'll back up a step um so you can see it from the beginning but are you all good now can you all see that over here now okay thanks rachel okay so this is this is uh, all i did so far was i went to the control panel and I'll come back i'll click here um, so this is the control panel and then scrolling down here subdomains is the thing i'm looking for under domains so if it's i have my window kind of compressed right now so it'll kind of be on the bottom left if it's like a normal size window and you're looking for this domains i guess box and then the option under here for subdomains takes you into this screen which lets you set things up and so this domain that's going to be the primary domain that it's on and you probably just have one option there i have lots um, but uh, yeah just pick your main domain and then this is my uh, my retro home page and I, had to, I just hit tab there and you can see that it creates this document route just let it do that automatically and then you hit create and once that's done then that's it right so it, what this does is it creates a folder on your direct in your um, storage area in your in your website and then uh, creates a subdomain that points to it uh, so now i should be able to go here and type my retro home page dot gdsd101.net yeah it works great um, doesn't look like much but this is what it should look like this is an empty subdomain and that's all that's what i just created i didn't put anything there yet so that's what you should see as well if you see this that means you did it right um, you may or may not see the cgi bin or you may see another sometimes there's another folder there i'm not clear on why those are there sometimes and sometimes not but you won't use the CGI bin folder probably, so it doesn't matter, but it's, it's, it's there. Don't worry about it. Uh, okay, so let's do a little bit of work over here with Sublime Text. This is uh, my preferred t uh, code editor, but there are lots. I'm gonna start typing some HTML here and kind of show you why a, a text editor like this is important. And I will, let me make that bigger so you can see it. Um, so I've written some HTML here. It's an opening. Um, the, the, the doc type declaration and then uh, and Alex it doesn't matter call it whatever you want to like if you already know what you want your homepage to be about just you might name it something like um, unicorns if you want to do a page about unicorns I don't know I thought I mean, I mean, my daughter's a big fan of unicorns uh, so if, if you were my daughter you would probably make your homepage about unicorns and so you might want to call it unicorns dot your domain dot com if you want uh, but for HTML, uh, a couple of things to keep in mind, like there's always the opening and the closing part. This is the closing part of the HTML element. This is the opening part. You should always have exactly one of each of those, one at the very beginning, one at the end, right? So uh, there are a couple others that form what we call the, the skeleton usually. Um, so it's closing, opening head, closing head, and then opening body, closing body. And I haven't saved this yet. And you can tell that because, well, my I have a lot of tabs here. Let me close some of these tabs. That's another thing I like about, uh, close, um, that's another thing I like about Sublime Text is you can have multiple tabs open. But see, there's a dot in that little tab there. That means that this is an unsaved document and I need to make sure to save it. So let me save it somewhere. And I don't think you'll be able to see these windows as they pop up, but I'm going to actually just put this on my desktop, but you should put it wherever it makes sense to you. Uh, I rec I really do recommend making a make sure I'm spelling this right. Uh, make a, a dedicated folder for this project. So you're going to have this HTML document. You might have others like images and other things. Make them all in the same folder on your computer. Like I, I like to keep things I'm working on on my desktop, but you can do other things if you prefer. Um, and I'm just calling this home.html for now. It doesn't really matter as long as it ends in .html because once it ends in .html, as you can see, Sublime Text changed. Sublime Text was like, oh, I know HTML. And so it wrote it this way. Um, it said, actually, is doc type supposed to be all caps? I can never remember. Um, it doesn't matter um, at this point. Maybe it is. I think doc type is supposed to be all caps conventionally. Yeah, there you go. So uh, now it's colored too. That looks better. 
And so this knows, so, so Sublime Text knows that it is, that it is HTML, and also uh, my web browser will know that it's HTML. So I can actually open this, even though it's still on my computer, I can open this with my web browser. I'm using Firefox here, and I can see what it looks like. So let me do that. Let me go here. Now I'm just going to use the like menu thing up here. And I don't remember how to do it. So I'm, I'm just going to do Control O because that's what you use on this computer to open things. So I'm going to do Control O, and then open that home page, open that HTML document that I just created in my web browser. And this is how I like to work when I'm working on a project like this, a, code, a web kind of code project. Um, so I have my source code over here, and I'm going to be adding things to it and saving it here. And then I'm going to refresh my web browser over here. And if you look way up at the top, <laughs> got to get my directions right, way at the top of this uh, web browser, you can see the URL. It looks pretty different. It looks different from the URLs that you're used to seeing on the web. So this is a, a web URL, and you can see it starts with HTTPS, cPanel, blah, blah, blah. Um, your browser might hide the HTTPS part of it, but I like to see it, so I have mine showing that. Um, so that's a web site. If you remember, HTTPS is Hypertext Transfer Protocol. Uh, that's the thing that makes this a web page. But this is a web page as well. It's just not on the web yet. And the URL here actually is a local URL. So it's file colon home Zach desktop my retro homepage. So this is actually pointing to a location on my computer. So if I copy this link and sent this to you, it's not going to work. Uh, I could, um, but that's um, it, it would be pointless. It would just be because it's a location on my computer and you don't have access to my computer. Um, what I'm going to do, and I'm not going to be able to, I'm not going to have time to do it on today's stream, um, but uh, what uh, I will show you how to do is uh, upload that to your uh, subdomain once you have um, some content there. So I know it's actually a little bit long, but let me, let me see if I can show you that. If you need to go, that's okay. Of course, this will be archived. Uh, let me just let me just complete the, these two steps here, so you so it's on this video at least, and then I can uh, add more later. So I'm going to add a little bit of content to my web page. So I'm going to say uh, um, Unicorn Central. Uh, that's the title of this web page. So I just hit Control S to save, and you can see that this is no longer a circle. It's the X. The X means I can click that to close the tab, um, but it also means that it's it is saved. And now when I switch over to my web browser, if I do this to refresh it, now I can see this thing that I just typed there. Then this is uh, Unicorn Central. Uh, so this should be fun. Now this is a file on my computer and my goal is to get it to show up inside of the subdomain. Remember I just made a subdomain, uh, my retro homepage.dgst101.net. So I need to, I'd like to get it here, right? I don't want it just to be on my computer. I want this to be a web page. So this is how I can do that. Whenever I created the subdomain, it created a document root, which means an area on my uh, on my web hosting account, like some an area, a folder on my um, on my server. So I need to find where that is and then upload my HTML file into that. So let's see if I can find that. So uh, I just clicked on File Manager. So from the cPanel, I'm looking for File Manager, and this takes me to the location and uh, I know I'm moving quickly, but I will make this a standalone video later for this. I just need to find my, there it is. Okay, there's my directory that got created. So you can see it's called myretrohomepage.djst101.net. So this is a folder named after my subdomain. And that's where the contents of my subdomain will appear. So I have an upload button I can click right here. And then I just need to browse to find the HTML document that I just created. There it is. And there it is. Okay, so I called it home.html. It's just 88 bytes so far. And if I go back to the directory listing, I should see it in the contents. And also, if I refresh the public side of it, the, the actual hosted URL, you can see that now the content of that page shows up instead of the, that empty list. So that was the process. That was very quick, and I haven't really talked about sort of what to put there or how to, how to figure these things out yet. Um, but we'll, we'll get there. We'll have time this week. Uh, I will either do something in class on Wednesday or maybe I'll put a, a few videos together today.
and have those up online for you. But um, that's th those are the kind of the tricky or parts of the process or the parts where people end up getting stuck. So hopefully that was helpful for me to demonstrate it there, even though that was pretty quick. Um, but anyway, thanks for watching today and good job discussing and um, you know the uh, responding to the short stories. I think there were some interesting interpretations and ideas going around there in the channel. So that's that was a good use of that. Definitely, thanks. Um, I still I've mentioned a few times sending out a survey to kind of see how people feel about um, the face-to-face -face cohorts. Um, we're, we're I'd like to continue with our plan like we've been doing uh, for you know for the to, to finish out this module. So. Um, I will probably send that out this week sometime, but uh, I haven't yet. So if you, if you, you haven't missed anything if you haven't seen that. Um, but if you are in the Wednesday cohort, please come Wednesday or let me know if you're not coming so that I, I know not to wait for you. Um, otherwise, if you are in the Friday cohort or if you're just online, then um, try to be online at, um, uh, at your scheduled time so that you can be ready in case I have some instructions for you. Uh, I, will, I might even do a brief live stream from the classroom on Wednesday. We'll see what I have time to put together. Okay, so thanks for watching. Uh, good job discussing and have a good day. It's a nice sunny afternoon, so hopefully you can get outside. Um, yeah, you can see the lights changing. Like what, that's something I haven't figured out how to what to do about like like my desktop is kind of shiny, so like when the sun hits, it like illuminates me from below, which is fine, I guess. But it the clouds keep coming and going, so it changes the lighting, and so this camera keeps trying to get the white balance right and it's kind of struggling sometimes. <laughs> anyway, just a new setup, still trying to figure things out. Anyway, thanks for watching. Have a good day. Bye.